So here we all are. I, 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 um, I don't know how many people are in already. Um, Beth, how do I know uh, how many people are with us? Oh, 20. cool. There are people. Yeah, lovely. Um, hello, hello, people. <laughs> yes. Hello, people. Um, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, I can't. We can't see you on our uh, on our screen. So uh, I'm uh, just going to um, trust that you are there. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to give give it sort of five ten minutes for people to uh, to join us. So um, you'll see the comments in the right hand. Uh, on the right hand side so um if you uh if you'd like to to make any comments obviously just uh, drop them in there um and after about five minutes we'll we'll get things properly kicked off um Um, okay, cool. Uh, so I think we are good to get started. So just to give a quick intro. Um, some of you may know this already, but we uh, we did uh, want to launch the .NET roundabout um, about 11 months ago. Um, but um, obvi obvious reasons as to why that uh, didn't actually uh, take off properly. Um, but um, just to give to give a bit a bit of background. Um, I work for a company called TRG. We're a tech uh, software and, and delivery um, uh, recruitment company, and we um, do a load of meetups on the side. So if anyone's interested um, in seeing the, all the different types of events we do, um, you can go to the roundabouts.co.uk, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I suppose uh, 12 months ago, um, Tom reached out to me um, because ASOS wanted to uh, to get involved in in some of the community stuff we do, and obviously with them being a big .NET house, um, it seemed like a good time as any as good a time as any to do a .NET roundabout, which had always been on the cards. Um, obviously, the idea was to to do it face to face um, and in person at uh, ASOS's um, revamped office, but we couldn't do that, and um, and now it uh, it seemed like as good a time as any to just get us get us underway really and do them um, do them virtually. So um, we are still I mean an iron as to how often we'll do these events, but I'm thinking maybe um, every other month um, might be um, might be the way to go. So um, basically, I just want to um, touch on ASOS and um, Moneybox's involvement. I'm really grateful for these guys to, you know, give their time up and um, and obviously yeah, to to give their talks for us uh, this evening. Um, as as they're speaking, you can um, feel free to put comments in the um, in the box if you want to ask any questions. We're going to save the questions till the end of the uh, end of the meetup. Um, so I'll keep an uh, keep an eye on all questions and I'll go through them as we. Uh, when we get to the end. Um, so Nix is going to go first, then we'll have Chris. Um, after the talks and after the questions, I do have the um, famous Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi to give away. Um, and we'll, we'll, I've got a little um, quiz question that Nix gave me um, that we can, uh, we can use to just give that away. Um, after the... Um, Afterwards, you can message me on Slack and send me your um, your address, and I'll get it in the post to whoever wins that one. And we do obviously have a Slack group, so if you have further questions for for Nitz or Chris, um, you can stick them in the Slack group. Um, I know Chris has already joined. Nitz, I'll send you the link if you haven't got it already. Um, and yeah, that's. Uh, that's about it. Uh, that's about it for me. Um, Tom, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about um, 
ASOS and the, the kind of the things you've got in mind for the for the community moving yeah on. yeah just more just to reiterate on the points you've made there Rob just first and foremost thanks to thanks to yourself Rob and, and Beth and the team at Agile Roundabout for setting this up um we've been pretty keen like you said to to get stuck in and give a bit of an insight as to the talent that we have at ASOS and and contribute to the community the .NET community in itself so I won't take up too much time but um like I said we're just keen to get stuck in and be very very nice to to see everybody on site as of when we can for some for some drinks and, and some pizzas as well It'd be nice but yeah. as Rob said we just we just pumped a load of cash into refurb in the office pretty much as pandemic kicked off so it was amazing timing but um be wicked to see everybody there for, as of when we are able to to host this on site cool okay well thanks uh, thanks for that um next do you want to um get started um absolutely Cool. Um, so, uh, slides. There we go. Awesome. So, um, oh, many funky views that we're getting. Awesome. All right. So, uh, my name's Nick Crabtree. I'm the lead principal software engineer at ASOS, um, and uh, I'm going to spend the next sort of twenty minutes um, talking about films that have absolutely nothing to do with software engineering and what we can learn about software engineering from them. So this is the Hollywood school of software engineering. And um, we're gonna kick, kick off, we would kick off if my, if my, there we go. So, Weird Science, one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, what IMDb says, uh, about this film is two high school nerds uh, use a computer program to literally create the perfect woman but she turns their lives upside down uh, those two people are uh, as from left to right Wyatt and Gary and in the middle is, is Lisa the, the woman they create um, but what it's really about is this two junior developers decide to create a product with no experience of the tools, the techniques, the processes, or any of that kind of stuff that they need to make it a success. And by sheer luck, they manage to deliver a version of their vision, but it exhibits a disturbing amount of unexpected behavior, which they can't control. That in turn quickly attracts two uh, inexperienced investors who pressure them into creating a duplicate product for their own gain. Now, in an attempt to satisfy these investors, and working in a high pressure environment, uh, very micromanaged environment, Gary and Wyatt um, have at it again, try to recreate what they did from memory. And the result, as you can probably guess, is, uh, is, is, is not what they expected. They did not deliver the promised product. Um, what they actually did was they created a, a Pershing II solid fuel, two stage, medium range ballistic nuclear missile in Wyatt's house, which went from the basement right up through all like three, four floors, through the attic and poked out the roof, uh, which uh, was a disaster. Um, in fact, the, the Pershing II is only a 10 meter missile, so they actually screwed that up as well. Um, so um, what we can learn from, from this, uh, this, this film is that there is always a temptation to just jump straight into the code, uh, work out what we do as we need to go. And we all did this as junior developers, right? So it's, it's all you know. The problem is that you lack focus and you will almost certainly end up with a bunch of code smells, no repeatability, no way of definitively asserting that what you're doing meets the requirements because you didn't actually define any requirements, you just, you just had at it. So we want to use techniques like ATDD or BDD to define our requirements in a format that everyone understands and turn them into executable requirements, um, which we can then implement down through our test pyramids. Our code is lean because we're only implementing what, what we need um, as we implement each uh, requirement. And we have a suite of unit tests, which define exactly what our, our software should do, which means as we evolve it with each new requirement, um, we're confident that that we haven't broken anything that's already there, and all of that is an essential foundation for you know highly trusted CI/CD pipeline and all the automation that goes with it. 
So, movie number two, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, what IMDb says about this film is that when strange thieves drift to Earth from space, mysterious pods begin to grow and invade San Francisco, California, where they replicate the residents into emotionless automatons one body at a time, which struck me that if you actually replaced seeds from space with tech startups, it's actually the modern day history of Silicon Valley, but that is not the point that I'm making. The point that I'm making is this. The film, what the film is really about is this. There is an aggressive acquisition and the legacy proprietary components need to be replaced. They are overcomplicated. They exhibit unpredictable behavior uh, as a result of long-term organic development. Uh, these components are, are difficult to understand. They take a significant amount of investment in time and effort uh, to study, observe, and characterize their behavior. Each component has its own unique set of responsibilities and dependencies, so it can't be removed without triggering system level alerts uh, or erratic behavior in, in other components closely related to it. Uh, we can't simply throw out all of the components to start from scratch because there are a number of core processes that need to remain operational or there's a risk of the whole system crashing, um, potentially suffering corruption, which could take considerate considerable effort to uh, to rebuild so uh what we what what they do is uh they actually employ uh a couple of established legacy refactoring patterns uh whereby they 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 take small parts of the system and they they grow new ones uh and those new ones act and behave exactly as the old ones did um on the outside but on the inside they're very different um, and gradually over time, they uh, they replace the entire system, all the components in the system with these new components. Um, and uh, what we what we learn from from this film, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, about uh, about technology and software engineering is that um, refactoring legacy codes, uh, replacing legacy systems uh, is is a daunting task and it does require a strong approach. But there are well-established patterns. These are proven patterns that give us a structure to work within. Um, the patterns that, that, that in, in my wild reimagining of this film are uh, things like the strangler fig pattern, um, where we, we gradually replace specific parts of the system with, with new applications and services, and we can um, start to, to integrate with those rather than the, the existing ones until the old ones are, are dead and we can get rid of them. Um, and anti-corruption layers where, where we can put in a facade or an adapter pattern um, and you know a, a, adapt the, the, the new semantics to the old semantics and, and bridge that gap as well. Number three, Groundhog Day. I mean, this says it all, right? Uh, this this is pretty much everything that we aim for in in a software development team in the, right here in this film. So, IMDb says uh, a weatherman finds himself inexplicably living the same day over and over again. But what it's really about is this: it is a beautiful, heartwarming, and accurate portrayal of continuous improvement. Um, a new joiner. A new joiner is handed an un unpredictable system to work with, has a very steep learning curve, finds his feet, and then approaches the problem by continually iterating over the process, constantly making adjustments, uh, measuring their successes, and in the end, everything runs like clockwork. Doesn't even have to think about it. Everything goes absolutely according to plan. Um, and and that, that actually ultimately not only benefits the system, but it also benefits him. Um, and he's rewarded by promotion to a, to a new, exciting and, and much more longer term and perhaps a little bit more of a diverse role. Um, ultimately, really, this embodies everything that, that we want um, to, to aim for in terms of continuous improvement and iterative cycles. Um, we, we look at what we have, we make small changes, we work out how, how to measure whether those changes are successful, um, and we we do this constantly and continuously, and uh, we do this with automation to make sure it's repeatable. And we reduce the margin for error, um, and um, and ultimately, um, 
that leaves us uh, much more time. <clears throat> excuse me, much more time to think about uh, the business challenges rather than the wiring. Legally Blonde. Uh, so Legally Blonde uh, is uh, about Elle Woods, apparently, a fashion sorority queen uh, who's dumped by her boyfriend. She decides to follow him to law school, and while she's there, she figures out that there is more to her than just looks. That's what IMDb says about it, but what it's really about is this. Uh, the, the existing management has a number of unconscious biases, biases which are instilled into the team. A switcher, L, joins the team, bringing with her a, a wealth of experience from a different, unrelated sector. She's bright, she's keen, she's motivated. She invests time in building relevant knowledge into personal relationships within and beyond the team. But tensions run high in the team because the toxic management style that's going on there uh, it means that they're reluctant to embrace fresh perspectives that, that she brings. Uh, in the end, uh, her seemingly unrelated knowledge actually is what uh, brings the entire project to a successful conclusion, um, all the time maintaining her best self, leveraging her interpersonal skills to forge this high trust, high performing team which breaks away from the toxic management which had been holding them back. Um, and this one's really simple, right? Uh, diversity and inclusion in, in, in development teams uh, has a lot of benefits, many well-documented benefits, right? Different people think in different ways, and that's not about their level of experience. It's not about the, their, their knowledge of the topic in hand, right? It's about everything that has made them who they are throughout their life and, and just... And, uh, forged the, their thought processes and the way that they view problems, challenges, and other things. So, um, it, 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 you know, we, we've known for a long time that gender mixed teams are beneficial because of the, of the ways that, that different genders, people think about problems. But this is, this is also true with uh, any kind of diversity, whether it be um, your, um, whether it be your race, whether it be your, um sexual orientation whether it be your um religious views you know these things are not relevant to the job but they are relevant to you as a person and as a team as a as a melting pot of ideas and, and influences um it, you can get some amazing benefits and you learn a lot as well from other people um titanic this is not about monoliths you might think this is about monoliths but it's not um, so uh, IMDb says this is a 17-year-old uh, aristocrat who falls in love with a, a kind but poor artist aboard the luxurious, ill-fated RMS Titanic. There's, there are two things that this film is really about. One, promising young talent treated as a second-class citizen, uh, and that foments a, a, a huge level of mistrust in what is already an overburdened, overly large team uh, which is which is already quite dysfunctional. The crux of the problem, however, is the short-sighted senior management in 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 this particular program of work. Who, uh, despite the information, uh, the telemetry from their engineers, um, the people working on 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 the projects, they decide that they're going to go for a an arbitrary deadline and just you know full steam ahead. Um, and what happens is, of course, they realise too late that uh, they uh, have endangered the entire project. So they then take a knee-jerk reaction. They, they reverse the engines, and at the same time, they try to uh, you know, change direction. What happens is that actually they just sideswipe uh, fully into an iceberg, and everybody sinks. So uh, this, this is kind of simple, right? And it boils down to two things. It's quality is remembered long after deadlines are forgotten. Um, and I think that goes with a generous side order of there are no second class citizens in a high trust, high performing team. Um, and and the, the thing to think about here is everybody knows about the Titanic, right? The Titanic sank 109 years ago. And the fact is that if they'd actually chosen not to go after that, you know, push for that deadline, despite all of the issues, uh, 
we probably wouldn't have heard of the Titanic now. Um, and uh, there wouldn't be films and musicals about it. You could, I realised, also replace everything I've just said in this entire segment with the words Cyberpunk 2077, which kind of would sum up everything I've just talked about. Karate Kid, a martial arts master, agrees to teach karate to a bullied teenager. What this film is really about, catters. That's it, catters. What we learn from it is that catters rock. And I'll give you an illustration of that. If someone like surprise questions you, like out of the left field, says, say a line from the Karate Kid, your automatic, your muscle memory reaction will be wax on, wax off. Uh, because you, you don't even need to engage your conscious brain because you watched it enough to know that wax on, wax off was the ultimate way of, uh, of the Karate Kid learning these muscle memory defenses and other things. Katas are really important, right? Very basic in terms of software engineering. Um, if you do a kata and you only do it once, you're not really getting the benefit. The point of a kata is that you do it over and over again so that the techniques that you're using are, are ingrained in muscle memory. It's like playing the piano. You know, you don't you don't sit down with a piece of music and play it once and then put it down. You practice it until you don't have to think about it. It's exactly the same thing. Katas are super important uh, re and, and fun. You know, they're a fun challenge that, um, that, that uh, you know, it gives you a, it's not, it's not just practice, practice, practice. It's actually quite an interesting um, challenge to see if you can solve it in a different way, even though it's the same kata. Last one, the Goonies. So IMDB says a group of young misfits called the Goonies discover an ancient map and set out on an adventure to find a legendary pirate's long lost treasure. Now, I tell you what this film is really about. The Goonies, which is essentially a small amateur semi-ethical hacktivist group, compete with the Fratellis, uh, uh, who are an established professional threat actor group. Uh, to breach a long outdated but still functioning system and acquire valuable data that can be traded for a large financial gain. The so-called Goonies uh, initially manage to get hold of some poorly guarded credentials uh, which they begin to use to test the edge defenses of the system and the so-called Fratellis focus on hacking them to steal their advantage. The Goonies use any improvised means they can to breach the layers of security without really understanding them or how they work, what they do, and often succeeding through a combination of luck uh, and the fact that those defenses are old, haven't been updated for a significant amount of time. And through a series of exchanges with uh, alternate successes and failures between the two competing groups, both reach the data at the core of the system. However, as hackers, they have a generally careless attitude um, in, in what they do once they're there. And uh, ultimately, this results in a colossal system crash, which irrecoverably destroys almost 100% of the data they were after. What can we learn from this? Well, uh, fun fact for you, um, average age of the Goonies, the, the, uh, the main characters in the Goonies there, uh, is 15. Uh, which is only two years younger than the average age of a hacker. Current hackers are 17 on average. So we're, what we find is that general tools and attacks are actually getting more sophisticated. You know, they're, they're, they're moving faster potentially than the systems that, that they're targeting. Um, and, you know, basic security controls uh, are... Are the, are the cause of many of these, these, these compromises. Um, the solar winds attack, which I'm sure we've all heard of, was, uh, was ultimately a, a default admin password of solar winds123, which, uh, which was active on their update server. Um, pretty basic stuff. Uh, account takeovers are, are becoming prevalent um, and they're becoming more sophisticated, more automated. Uh, people are using poor passwords, you know, they're not, they're not 
continually updating their defenses. They're, they're, they're basically um, allowing easy ways in. Social engineering um, is, is another significant risk. Um, you know, in, in the Goonies, they just they found some stuff in their loft that was left lying around. It's you know, not so different to you leaving passwords lying around or, or responding to, to uh, you know, requests for information that, that you don't fully validate before, before providing it. Um, and um, ultimately, um, it, it's an ongoing battle you can't just leave your you can't just write your system write your defenses and then leave it and hope that it's good it's uh, it's a constantly evolving war so that is the end uh so i think i'm actually slightly over um but i want to summarize here because what i've basically done for 20 odd minutes is is take a, a series of somewhat outrageous liberties with the plots of well-known movies um that have nothing to do with software engineering um but they all kind of made sense, right? I mean, I wasn't talking, I wasn't describing completely different plot and everyone was going, this doesn't make any sense, right? It was close enough um, that at least hopefully it had some comedy value. But that's, that's the hidden gem here, right? The hidden gem here is that I have a bunch of software engineering patterns in my head that I've learned and I've used and I've honed over the years. Um, and they've become so familiar to me that I can readily recognize them and apply them in very different contexts. In this case, I look at a film. I didn't actually, this came to me, it was Groundhog Day was the first one that came to me. And this is something I put in a talk years ago. And it occurred to me that it was, it was continuous improvement. And it occurred to me that it was a pattern that I recognized and I just happened to see it in a film that had nothing to do with it. So the key thing here, the key takeaway is that good software engineering practices transcend the language, the tools, and the frameworks. A good software engineer can can see those patterns that underpin good software and and the processes surrounding it, um, and and apply them. And that you know you can you can that could be a small step like you start on a new team with a new code base. It could be a bigger step where you're you know you're you're a, a Java engineer and and you're asked to go and work in a .NET team and you don't know the language, but I guarantee you you will spot the patterns, you'll, you'll spot the code smells, you'll spot the, um, the, the you know, that there's no automation, you'll, you'll spot these things. Um, and it's, it's that, it's that that makes a great software engineer, not the language that they write or the syntax they use. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, I thought it was really good. And um, yeah, you certainly made it, um, Far easier for me to understand uh, uh, the patterns you described using uh, using uh, using the films. Um, Chris, are you ready to go? Yep, I am indeed. Oh wait, Rob, I think there's some questions for Nick. Uh, I think we're doing questions after. Is that we did at the end? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're going to cool. do kind of questions right. afterwards. As you were. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll get started. Um, so my name is Chris Haynes. I'm a principal engineer um, at Moneybox on our investment platform team. Um, I've been working in startups and scale-ups for, for around the last 10 years. So um, I just wanted to share some of my sort of uh, thoughts and around technology decisions you can make. Um, that are sort of practical um, when you're when you're at that early stage of a business. Um, I, I think there's a lot of presentations at the moment on 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 trends topics, things like microservices, but that's not always like a practical approach to take when you're starting a business. So um, I just wanted to to go through some of that. Um, I'm going to start with a quick introduction to Moneybox because a lot of people might not have heard of us. A bit about mindset, architecture, infrastructure, and then how we are architecting our systems at the moment. So um, Moneybox's mission is to help everyone save and invest for their future. Um, we think there's around 20 million people in the UK that don't have real access to wealth management services, but you know want to do something with with their money. Um, so we're trying to serve that that market. We it's believed about 10 million people in that bracket don't have any savings above 2,000 pounds. So so we're trying to help people with that. 
Uh, we're an app-based product. Um, and we have everything in one place. We do pensions and savings accounts, investment. So, so we're sort of like a one-stop shop to help help you save money. Um, I just wanted to put in these charts. These are as of, as of July um, last year. I've stolen these from a crowdfund deck, um, but we're now over um, half a million customers. Um, so you can see we've had pretty pretty um, good growth, and um, and the amount of money that we're holding on behalf of our customers is, is risen rapidly. Um, so, you know, this was as of July, um, we're now over 1.2 billion pounds worth of money held for people. And you can imagine that all of that um, creates load in our systems, you know, more customers, uh, more transactions being put through. You know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of deposits a week into our system. So, so you know, we're, we're scaling our systems to, to cope with that load as well. All right, enough about uh, who we are. So on to uh, how you should sort of, sort of think about things when you're working at an early stage startup. Um, you know, you can't, you can't always assume that your business is going to be successful. Some of the failure rates are alarmingly high. Um, and this should sort of help inform some of your decision making as, as you go through and, and build out software um, for a, a new business or an early stage one that's scaling up. Um, one of the one of the sort of quite you know large proportion of the reason this happens is that you're either beaten to the market or that you misread the market demand. You know you may have built something that people didn't want or you or you got it wrong, and and you know people didn't find it useful. So you know you should keep that in the back of your mind that you you need to get things into your customers' hands quickly and, and validate your business ideas. And another another interesting sort of thought process is to say that you're never too big to fail because this can lead to the complacency. Um, Scale Factor um, is an accounting software company um, and you know they were using quite aggressive marketing um, uh, sort of materials and approaches and and they they were building software that didn't live up to the customer's expectations and then people like Xero and QuickBooks came along um, and, and and the business ended up shutting the doors, and you know they've had 104 million pounds worth, uh, million dollars worth of funding, um, and, and you know, um, you know, bigger than that, we've got Jawbone, who were a competitor to Fitbit. Um, they they just didn't, they just couldn't get profitable, and they had nearly a billion dollars worth of funding, um, and and a VC funding, and it was the second cost costliest startup failure of all time, um, and so just you know. Keep that in mind when you're when you're building these out. So some of the things you can take away from that is to get to market quickly. Um, Moneybox went from uh, cutting you know cutting the first opening the first code base commits um, to to go live in a year, um, and, and you know at the end of that year it was really being held up for regulation. And so you want to get your get your get your product into your customers' hands uh, like as soon as possible to validate it. Um, release release often as well. You know, use use MVPs. Um, you don't have to have a full feature complete thing to get into your customers' hands. Um, you know, Moneybox also utilizes um, beta users. Um, we we have a release stream for some really engaged users that help provide feedback to us to validate them. And also, don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think you know a lot of a lot of startups and companies talk about blameless cultures. And and, and Nick Nick was talking about you know a team a high performing team. You know, this built on trust. You really have to do that. It's not just about um, you know top down. You know managers not blaming you. You can't blame your teammates when when things go wrong. You have to look at what went wrong and, and put put procedures in place or you know automation or testing around something that went wrong. Okay, so let's let's talk about um, architecture a little bit. So you know I I talked about there's a lot of on trend things at the moment, microservices, actor models, things like that, and. Um, I've not I've not mentioned actors in this. I just want to sort of generalize across these three types of architectures. I think a lot of new architecture in, in small businesses could be classified into these. Um, yeah, so if you look at the bottom, I've got the developer productivity is greater towards the left. I think as you build out more distributed systems like microservices and things, you just increase complexity. You add messaging layers, you're adding interfaces between um, them. Um, your deployment model becomes more complicated. And so, you know, when you're trying to validate an idea at an early stage startup, you know, the monolith is all, you know, it's not to be afraid of going down that route to, to validate your ideas. So let's, let's look at some of the strengths and weaknesses of each of these. So 
Um, as I said, developer productivity is probably going to be the highest in a, in a monolith. Um, you'll be able to deploy it easily, just throw it on an Azure app service. You've got less infrastructure, less things to monitor. Um, but the downside to this is, is that your code base can get um, can get messy if you don't structure it well. So try and still modularize it potentially inside your code base and keep things as clean as possible. And you know, there's there's a human factor to working in a monolith that becomes a problem at some point. You know, if you have 30, 40, 50 engineers working in a single service, you're going to start tripping over each other. Um, and you know, you you might you might lose ownership of, of certain areas. There'll be there'll be blurred lines about which potential sub teams or teams own parts of it. And and you could potentially run into scaling issues. You know, if everything's just sat on one SQL database or whatever, you 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 might run into problems. Self-contained systems and service-oriented architecture. So you you start to increase your complexity, but you know it's it's often quite manageable. Um, you can start to scale things independently. There's you know clean clear ownership. So if you've got two teams of uh, two teams of ten or or whatever developers, um, you know you can own separate systems more clearly between them, um, and you you obviously want to make sure that there's fault tolerance between those. So. You know, if your if if your money box and your your payment system goes down, it shouldn't stop people viewing the app, for example. Um, and you can start to deploy things more independently, which can reduce risk as well. Um, but you know, if you get your boundaries wrong um, between the systems, you know, you you make one system dependent completely on the other ones because you got your boundary wrong. All you're starting to do now is build a distributed monolith, um, and, and it's very hard to backtrack from 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 getting those boundaries wrong. And, and and if we look at microservices, say you obviously, if you build it correctly, you know you should get the scaling benefits. Um, you should be able to scale your team up. As I said, there's a human factor. You know, if you're if you're working in smaller code bases, you can scale the number of people working on them to greater amounts. Um, but there's a massive upfront cost you have to pay with microservices generally. Um, you've got a much more complex deployment model. Um, you're gonna, you know, you've got to build in potential messaging between them. How do you deal with message failure between them? Dead letter queue management, uh, monitoring between them, service discovery. You know, things get more complicated, which is why I tend to believe that the productivity is going to be, you know, higher at the um, at the monolith end of things at the start of your business. And also, let's not let's you know let's not forget that often MVPs get rebuilt you know within a few years. And you know, as Nick's mentioned, you take pieces out and you build in you, know, you you take bits out of your monolith and you make new systems from it and integrate with them. Um, you know, that's a really good good way to go. So, you just want to look at some businesses that um, that have gone down different routes because I think this is quite a good way to look at look at the options. So. Um, Moneybox, um, for example, you know, we went down the monolith route when we started, and uh, got to market in a year, got a good market share. We've got great customer growth, and, and you know, customers are depositing more and more money with us. You know, that's a good success story. Stack Overflow is a really interesting case. You know, they're a strong believer in keeping things simple, and it's a website you all probably use every day. Um, they, they've got a handful of web servers uh, in a data center in New York that sits on top of a SQL database. Um, you know, they've kept it simple. They've still kept it simple. GoCardless is a is a direct debit um, provider. You know, they 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 were taking billions of pounds a month um, in for people, um, and again, it's, um, uh, they they went live with a monolith. Uh, Starling Bank's an interesting one. They went down the self-contained systems route um, quite early on, um, which is great. So it's sort of a hybrid between um, a monolith and, and and microservices. So really, just distinct units um, and systems that can operate independently. And we all know GitHub and GitLab, those were Ruby monoliths. Um, uh, and, you know, they're fantastic tools. So if we look at the other side of things, Monzo and Uber, really interesting cases. So they were really well funded really early, and you know, their business models are based on a critical mass. Um, you know, Uber needs a critical mass of drivers to 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 be successful. They need to scale. Um, at the human factor, you know, they've got very large engineering teams, and they've had large engineering teams early on. Um, and, and so, you know, you can't just be running that out of a monolith. As I said, there's, you're going to have contention on it. So, but what you're doing more in that case, you know, you're paying serious amounts of money in the tens of millions to build out an infrastructure and engineering team of that size very early on. And, 
you know, we'll go back to the, the numbers we were looking at earlier. A lot of startups fail. You know, you, you, it's more of a gamble to go down that route. Um, but, you know, perfectly valid case. If you if you really believe that you've got, you know, strong customer demand, which I think they clearly were in both of these business cases, and you're well funded, then, they, you know, obviously that's a really good um, way to go because you're sort of setting yourself up for the future more. Some of the businesses to the left of this, you know, weren't, maybe weren't so funded. They had much smaller engineering teams at the start. So the approach they took got them into market quicker. Um, and, you know, as I said, there's a lot of presentations that go around on trendy things like microservices, um, which, by the way, I'm very supportive of all of those architectures. I've worked with all of them across my career, um, some successful, some not. Um, but just be wary of CV led development. Don't just pick, you know, if you find yourself working at an early stage startup as an engineer, don't just go, right, let's build it in microservices because that's what you want on your CV. Um, as most MVPs are rebuilt quite early on. Um, you don't maybe you don't exactly know what you're building yet. Moneybox pivoted um, sometime, you know, early on as well. We were, you know, building a, a stocks and shares and funds investment um, product. Yet we moved into cash and savings quite quite quickly, and you know, we ended up having a market leading um, lifetime ISA um, in the cash world. Um, you know, that wasn't something that was on the cards very early on. So you don't you may not exactly know what you're building yet. Do you have a clear product vision? Do you exactly know where your boundaries are if you were going to go down that route? So, you know, keeping it keeping it simple early on is is you know it's a really sensible way to go. And as I said, you know, go down the microservices route if it makes sense. If you can justify it, just you know, make sure you can justify it. All right, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about infrastructure. So, um, I think, you know. Anyone in their right mind will pick the cloud these days. Um, I don't think anyone's going to go buying hardware to put in a data center, um, especially, you know, as an early stage startup. Um, you do not want to be managing hardware if you can get away with it. And so, you know, selecting a cloud, um, they're all pretty similar these days. Um, Google Google's functions runtime supports .NET Core now and things like that. So, um, you know, they're all pretty similar. I, I think what tends to happen in, in, in these scenarios is that people just pick, you know, what they come with, what they've got experience with. Um, the only thing I would say is if, you know, if you want to run a SQL Server database, it's always going to be cheaper on Azure because they're not passing on the license cost, um, which see they have to do at AWS and Google, and um, they've, they've recently introduced uh, serverless SQL databases. Um, I think this is a, a really important point to stress for a, for a new startup. Um, you know, there's the platform as a service world versus the infrastructure as a service. Um, what tends to happen in the infrastructure as a service realm is that you you might want site reliability engineers to manage that infrastructure. Um, it's a lot more complicated to set up. There is more um, time needs to be spent on it. You know, if you're if you're running virtual machines of any kind, you need to patch them. You need to look after them. What happens when they run out of disk space? Um, you know, if you're setting up a Kubernetes cluster, who's going to do that? Who's going to look after it? Um, who's going to build a more complex deployment pipeline to it? You know, there is beauty and simplicity when it comes to platform as a service. Um, you know, on Azure, you can just throw up an app service. You just got to package it from from your build system and, and then and then just call an API endpoint and it deploys your, your app service for you. It's uh, remarkably easy to use and requires very little time to manage. Um, you know, functions are an obvious win in, in any of these clouds. Um, I think with AWS Beanstalk, you still need to manage some VMs. Um, I haven't used it for a long time, so I'm not exactly sure if that's still the case. Um, but yeah, I think um, you should always be choosing platform as a service over infrastructure as a service early, early on. Um, you know, you just generally can't afford to be spending time on that. You know, you have to ask yourself, are you going to be running infrastructure better? Um, you, can you run, can you manage a set of VMs or a Kubernetes cluster better? then the clouds can operate app services or app engine. I don't think anyone can answer that yes to that truthfully. Um, you, you know, there's more and more cloud, people embracing cloud more and more these days. And um, this, I think this is less of an opinion that's formed these days, but people were afraid of vendor lock-in. They were like, I don't want to be tight to AWS because we might want to move to another cloud. Um, but I, you know, I, th I think we should rubbish that viewpoint, you know, embrace the cloud you're running on. Um, you know, there's a lot of good services available on these clouds that will help you build your software quickly and get to market quickly. And you know, let's look at some examples of that. 
Um, you know, I've used RabbitMQ extensively in my career. I love it. I think it's a great tool. Um, it would be my go-to choice, you know, um, from my comfort zone. And developers tend to pick the technologies that they're most comfortable with. But if you pick RabbitMQ, there's no managed RabbitMQ on most of the clouds, um, certainly not on Azure that we use. Uh, and so you have to ask yourself, like, if RabbitMQ goes down, who's getting called? Who's going to pop that back up? Um, is it the most sensible you know, use of my time to be managing a RabbitMQ cluster? Um, and so you know, avoid the temptation to, to, to avoid vendor lock-in or, or use what you're most comfortable with. You know, the time spent converting your knowledge set over to something like Azure Service Bus or Amazon SQS or Google PubSub, it's going to be much smaller than the time that it takes you spent managing that and, and dealing with failure um, of those services occasionally. Um, so like I, likewise with uh, MongoDB, you know, if you've decided you want to use a document store um, in your in your new business or your new startup, you know, that's great. But can you manage a MongoDB server better than Azure can manage their Cosmos DB? Um, the answer is going to be no to that. And, you know, staying native opens up other paths as well. So, um, you know, they've got function runtimes now on all of the clouds. So um, you can do function triggers from Azure Service Bus, um, from Cosmos DB. Um, you know, you start to open up these paths um, to, to, you know, integrating more with other services in the cloud to make life easier for you. Um, you know, there's also useful stuff, you know, that, that you might discover later on, um, you know, as a side effect. So um, we, we use um, Cosmos DB quite heavily and, you know, we, we just wanted to do a bit of data analysis recently and it was just using the, the browser-based query, um, query engine. You know, that's more difficult. Um, you know, if you're hosting something yourself, you might have to open up um, access to, 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 to web portals, um, you know, to, to get access to that or use a, a desktop-based MongoDB Explorer. Um, you know, it's just, it's just not well as integrated. So this is a, a few stats about um, our, our setup at Moneybox. Um, we basically live the platform as a service mantra. Um, the only VMs that we have in the entire business are, are six build VMs um, running Team City and Octopus, but we're slowly moving over to Visual DevOps, so those are going to we're going to get rid of those. Um, we're completely in app services. Again, we don't want to manage any actual infrastructure. Um, our deployment model isn't complicated enough for something like um, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so yeah, we've got roughly 70 app service um, app services running across the four environments. And um, we're using Service Bus and Event Hub for, for for messaging, which is nice. So again, we're not managing any any messaging technologies. Um, you know, and it's important to note that. We don't have any dedicated site reliability engineers or, or DevOps people. We don't have any dedicated DBAs um, because it's all platform as a service. We haven't had you know, the, the staff cost of, of hiring those people in to manage it because Azure is managing it all for us and it very rarely goes wrong. Um, we've got 40 database instances across the environments um, in our two primary databases in production. We've got 4 billion records, which is quite a lot. Um, and, and nearly a billion Cosmos um, records as well. All right, so I just want to talk a little bit about our architecture. So what we've taken the approach of not reinventing the wheel. Um, if it's not in your core competencies, can you get it off the shelf? Don't build it. Um, Moneybox isn't a payments company. We're a company that invests money on people's behalf. So uh, I'll put an example on here of using Go Cardless. So we decided very early on we were going to use direct debit because it's the cheapest form of, of taking payments. So um, yeah, we, we integrated with Go Cardless. We didn't even think about trying to do any of that ourselves. Um, we've integrated with lots of third parties to get the business started. Um, you may end up Placing some of them later down the line, but it's okay. Like use use what's use what's available to get you to market quickly. You know, keep keep those core focuses in mind about you know be customer centric. Please, you know, validate your ideas with your customer. So if it's not in your core competencies, don't don't build it. Just get it off the shelf. So we went down the monolith route um, in the in the early days, um, uh, as as you might expect uh, from a lot of startups. Um, we have three deployables um, uh, in app services uh, and, uh, and an API for the app. Um, is we're all app based. There's no there's no customer website, um, an internal admin portal, and then a background processing server um, that we use Hangfire for. 
Um, so yeah, we just kept it kept it simple. We were really focusing our energy on building features for customers. You know, we were starting to to scale up. You know, you you're not gonna you're not gonna generally get too many scaling problems um, early on. You can, there's lots of sliders you can drag in Azure. Um, you you buy your way out of any scaling problems early on generally. Um, and this is sort of where we moved to. So we're we're sort of down the middle on the three architectures that I that I showed earlier. We're down the sort of self-contained system route. Um, you know, to to go back to what Nick said again, we've taken bits out of the monolith and built them out into their own systems. Um, you know, we don't we haven't done big rewrites and in, in big bang. You know, we've taken bits out and slowly migrated across to them. Um, you know, one of the biggest projects we've done over the last couple of years is, is build an in-house trading platform, which is a team I work in. We used to outsource the the, the trading in the market um, to, to a third party. Um, you know, they weren't they you know they weren't as agile as us. They they couldn't get new features out as quickly as we wanted. So you know, we took took that into our own hands and we built our own investment platform. Um, you know, but we kept it simple again. We've got some app services running the running API and batch similar setup. Um, we've got a collection of functions in there. We built messaging between the two systems and, and APIs between them, internal APIs. Um, and, and, and you know, another big project we did was um, Moneybox has a roundups feature where you can sort of save the change style thing. So, um, you know, initially that was outsourced. We were, we were using a third party company to get access to um, customers' bank statements so we could read their transactions and round them up. Um, but then again, we wanted to lean on the new open banking infrastructure that was being rolled out um, by all the banks. So, you know, we started a team inside the business that built um, a, an open banking system. So a few times a day, we go and scrape um, scrape all our customers' bank statements that have got roundups enabled, grab the new transactions, and then and then round up, um, you know, and collect collect the money from them later on that week. Um, and another thing we've done with with uh, uh, the sort of affiliate marketing um, thing that we've got called Moneybox Plus. Um, uh, we we pulled that out of the of the monolith um, and 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 separated that into a separate system. So it's really you know where are we going um, in, in you know from here onwards? Um, it, it's somewhat to be decided. But the really important thing is that you do that boundary um, analysis. You know that you would need to do upfront with any architecture, the microservices or, or, or self-contained systems. You've got to really get that boundary um, selection right because. If you if you get that wrong with microservices and you make uh, a service dependent on another service dependent on another service, what you've essentially done is made a, a distributed monolith and you can't backtrack from that very easily once it's live. Um, so I think the clear message here is really identify your service boundaries well, whatever architecture you're in, so that you can pull things apart um, in, in a structured way. Um, so wrapping up. Um, Generally, like the, the maybe like the uncalled truth uh, of, of working in a startup is monoliths are usually the most appropriate starting point. Um, you know, you, you might not know exactly what you're building yet. You might need to pivot quickly. You just need to build features quickly. Um, platform as a service is vastly superior for small teams. Um, you really don't want to be spending time managing infrastructure when you could be spending that time building value for your customers. Don't reinvent the wheel. Take things off the shelf where you can. And I think something that's not talked about enough is really being mindful and respectful uh, of what already exists. I've been guilty of this in the past. I've seen it time and time again when new developers join a startup. You know, it's very easy to criticize a monolith and go, this is uncool. Why is this done like this? Um, but, you know, some things, sometimes things are done quickly. Um, sometimes, you know, at the time that they're built, people recognize it's not the best way to go, but you just got to get on with it. Um, and so don't always just come into a new business and criticize what's there. Some people have poured their blood, sweat and tears into getting that live. So, um, so yeah, just look at it as a, as a challenge of how to move forward. How do you, how do you break this apart? Do the work to identify those boundaries, you know, propose, propose better ways to do it. Okay. That's it. Um, and, you know, shameless plug here, we are hiring. Um, We've uh, we keep winning awards for the best um, like some of the best startups to to come and work for. Um, the company's on a great trajectory with the you know you've seen the growth in uh, in how we're doing. So it's a really cool place to work. Come join us. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I thought it was really uh, really good. If anyone's got any um, any questions for um, either Nick or uh, Chris, obviously um, feel free to uh, pop them in the uh, in the comments chat. Uh, there, um, I guess I um, wanted to ask you, um, Chris, 
whether how much how much you feel um with microservices or, or self-contained how much it's kind of platform dependent so like if you say mobile first for example i think it i think it is really um really dependent on your business needs right um you know if if you if you take a step back and look at what Moneybox offers, just as a, as a good example, you know we're app based, but most of our customers don't log in more than once a day. So do you, do you really need like huge scaling capacity early on to serve your customers with their account information once a day? You know, we've even got half a million customers now, half a million requests a day. You know, it's a few more requests than needing one to load the whole app, but you know. You don't need like huge server farms. You don't need you don't need very complex deployments. Um, but you know if you're if you're working in a very high traffic web environment, maybe that's not going to scale very far. Um, but again, you don't need to overcomplicate your initial um, your initial build. You can get a lot of um, bang for your buck from effective caching strategies and things like that. So yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thanks. Um, I suppose. Um, Seeing as everyone's kind of talking microservices and and, and um, ASOS, you you guys are doing uh, doing a lot of that sort of stuff. Do you have any any thoughts on on this in general, Nix? Yeah, I mean we we did our own um, you know big replatforming um, quite a few years ago now. Um, we we finished it four or five years ago, um, and we we transitioned from a, a, a monolithic architecture to a microservices architecture um and it was yeah it was it was a journey <laughs> but um but we you know we we employed the you know all of the good things that that we've talked about you know both chris and i in, in our sessions um and you know it was a it was a it was a huge success and an awful lot of work like you know a lot of people put in a lot of work but it was a success um and you, you can only achieve that success through two things really in, in any big refactoring, replatforming kind of exercise. And that's, you know, you, you use the, um, the structure that, that um, allows you to, to, to do it in a known way. And you need the courage to do it. You, there, there is no replatforming, there's no, you know, big refactoring with 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 the trepidation of oh i don't know if we should touch that because it might break something you'll never get anywhere you have to, you have to say we're pulling this out we're replacing it with this we're going to use these approaches to do it but it's going and it's going at this point and we if there is fallout we will deal with it and we'll we'll have the the processes in place to react to that and fix fast fix forward um, and that's the only way that you're going to make progress. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think it's worth saying like you can only get to that point when you when you're successful enough to warrant it. Right? You don't know if you're going to be successful enough to warrant a replatform, and it's a very very nice problem to have because it means your business is doing well. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's a great point. I guess um, sort of hindsight is a beautiful thing, but it's not going to change anything, right? So at the time, you made the right decision that what you felt was the right decision at that time given the information you had right so yes okay you could look back and think and maybe use it as for lessons but there's no point in dwelling on stuff right yeah and i you know i think that it's if you if you're going to do something as a as a massive big bang then that's also an, a massive amount of of regret or, or that or the, that you could feel when it doesn't go the way you thought right so that you want to you know it all, again coming back to the things that both chris and i've talked about you know you want to put in those those gradual transitions that allow you to you know ease into moving into new systems you want to put in strangler patterns and you know you want to put in the the whatever whatever software design patterns help you to start to move um and react to those problems at a very kind of you know micro level um because that you, you can react to them much more quickly than if you do a big you know it's, i mean it's, it sounds very much like everything comes down to agile versus waterfall right ultimately it doesn't matter what you talk about in software 
But it's it's that as well, right? It's that it's a big upfront investment for a big payoff, and and that that also means a big risk. So you mitigate that risk however you can. Yeah, sure. Um, I was also going to ask you next as well. Um, in terms of um, your talk and obviously principles and all that sort of stuff, how when you've got like let's say you, you guys must do like graduate training schemes and and uh -huh. or higher juniors and all this sort of stuff so when it comes to actually teaching juniors and, and coaching them like how much how much do you sort of write day one let's go through let's go through this or would you uh, would you use the uh given the talk yeah. go through uh, go, go through groundhog day with them yeah so so actually we know we we iterated over this right we we honed our graduate program so we had grads interns and switchers um who who will um uh would join at different points um grads and interns would join at different different um different parts of the calendar year but but we would try to align it so that they all ended up together but um but yeah we refined it over time and what what we what we did and it was i mean it was phenomenal i've never seen a, a grad program anywhere that was as good as the one that we ran right it was phenomenal and it, there were a lot of um you know a lot of people who put in a, a lot of work um to make that happen um, um essentially what we ended up with was um about th three months of boot camp where we had, you know, I think we had up to 50 engineers involved where we would go in and we would run one hour sessions or whatever. And they'd get, they'd get people from all over technology coming in and delivering things like, you know, software engineering principles, but also, you know, how do you, what does a good requirement look like? And, you know, how do you secure stuff? You know, all this kind of stuff, but it's still all academic, right? Um, so then what we did is we we put them on a project. So they formed their own teams. So we had a front end team of grads. We had a, a back end team of well, grads and interns and switches. Um, and we they, they had to go and recreate the ASOS website from scratch. And not the entire thing, because, you know, we have 400, 450 engineers doing that kind of thing, right? So. <laughs> It's, um, but we wanted them to, to stand up a basic e-commerce site that looked like the ASOS site and, and followed the ASOS principles. Um, they, they had to run it, deploy it in, in Azure. They, you know, they, they, they had to, to make it work. Uh, they had to deal with stakeholders, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so they're actually applying mm -hmm. the things that they've learned in practice and getting the guidance to um you know change direction where where they needed to and you see that you know you see some hilarious things where they they'll 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 naturally you know i talked about this when i talked about junior developers going smashing in code it's exactly what they do they, they go and solutionize everything all oh, right okay so we know what we need. we're going to do this tech and we're going to do this we're going to make this happen and and you let them do it for a week and then you say okay but who have you spoken to to get these requirements <laughs> and they're like mm. <laughs> okay let's do a bit of a reset and it's it's that practical experience in a safe environment where next time they do it they'll go okay yeah we know how to do this now yeah yeah i'm sure um what about you guys chris obviously being a bit that bit smaller and stuff like that when it comes to standards and, and making sure kind of that everyone is following whatever standards you want to set how how do you do that particularly with sort of younger or more junior developers i should say um i think we've we very much got a uh thrown into the deep end approach um which is really great um you know very much supportive of that though we we give people the time they need to to build something out but it's you know learning learning as we go um and um you know, one of the ways that we work on, on my team is that a lot of the engineers have to go and, and gather their own requirements. You know, we don't have a product manager on my team. So it makes the engineers really engaged um, because they have to go and speak to all the different parties and work out exactly how something should work. So um, that, that's quite empowering for new people at all levels, um, which which is really good. I like, I really like working that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... Okay, um, shall we get on with the little giveaway I've got um, and see um, 
see see if this if this goes well. Um, so obviously for anyone who didn't miss it, not, I have a Raspberry Pi along with all the bits and pieces uh, to give away. Um, so we've got a question which is not technical; it's just guess, um, and the closest person to uh, get the right answer, um, I'll stick this in the post to you. Um, so the question I have, which was provided by Nix, um, uh, apparently TikTok shouted out uh, ASOS for having one of the most creative brand campaigns of 2020, but how many video, video views did we get in the first six days? So how many, how many people watched the ASOS um, brand campaign for 2020? 2020 after TikTok shouted it out. So um, I want to uh, throw out some answers on the, um, on the comments. I will keep, uh, keep tabs on it. And um, obviously whoever gets closest, I will um, get your prize out to you. Um, obviously, if you've got any, any further questions for, um, for the guys, then um, sling them to as well. And, um, and we'll get them asked to uh, ask the speakers. Um, what did you, what did you, what did you think of that then, Tom? Very insightful. I mean, obviously, my understanding of text very layman in itself. Um, I've got to say, Nick, what was the first film that you put up there? Weird Science. Weird, Weird Science. science that's dun, it. Dun, 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 I haven't seen that one. Is it a bit of a cult? Classic? What? No, I haven't seen get it. Get out! Get out! <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't seen, I haven't even heard of it. Joking me. What oh, year was that made? Was 1986. 86. 85. No, oh. the mid-80s. Um, yeah, it's classic. Abs absolute classic. Um, and there's, it's flawless. It's a flawless film. There's, <laughs> there's, you can't. You cannot. There's nothing bad that you can say about it. But, the you know, special effects looked a bit special. The special effects were outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even heard of it. I'll give that a whirl. Yeah, you need to get. You need to get on it. What is the rating it's on best, IDB though? <laughs> to, if it's any lower than nine, it's wrong. Um, <laughs> do, you just need to get. It's the best hour and a half you'll spend this year. I'm telling you. Um, which is the? We, uh, I don't know if you mentioned, but did you have a favourite out of all of them? Was that to me? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, the one that really em embodies the, and they're all a bit tenuous, right? And they're, they're, they're you know, the, the, the reinterpretations were for slightly comedic effects, but it, it, the, I suppose the, it is Groundhog Day that really is the most obvious example. And uh, so there's, it's what we do right we 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 what we should do we should we should continuously improve everything we do right and make it good but i think you know there's got to be a special shout out to well, it's a special shout out to weird science because i love weird science and um but i think special shout out to um uh to legally blonde right because it, we don't necessarily think about diversity as being a benefit to the way we work, you know, we we understand more and more now, and this is a great thing. We understand that diversity is a great thing um, for people, but it but it is a great thing for a software engineering team because different perspectives spark different ideas, and and th that breeds creativity, um, and you know, and, that, and you can do amazing things. So yeah. Yeah, I just pulled it up on IMDb, Nick. It's actually six point six out of ten. I'm afraid it's so, wrong. No, it's wrong. It's upside down. You're looking at upside down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chris, out of uh, out of all those principles, then do you have uh, all, out of all those films or principles? Do you have a uh, one that, uh, that that you kind of uh, that jumped out at you? I uh, I really like Groundhog Day. Anyway, I think it's a great film and. Um, I, I think the um, continuous self-improvement is like such an important factor for any engineer. Um, maybe I'm copying out now saying the, the same, the same one, but um, yeah, I really feel like that's important. Um, should always, yeah. always be looking at ways to improve things and yourself. Um, but, you know, as, as I said at the end of my talk, be pragmatic about that as well. Um, and, and 
and be respectful to things that are there and, and look for ways to improve things in a, in a structured and, and, and achievable way. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the comments and we do actually have a winner. Someone we got, do. Someone Hang got on. It, on. Um, so uh, David Gordon, you got that, um, um, got that completely correct. I did think that there was another chap David uh, Barrows came very close with 1.3 billion, but unfortunately, yeah, uh, got pipped by David Gordon. So um, if you're on Slack, uh, on the Slack um, group, the, uh, the Roundabouts um, Slack group, drop me a uh, direct message or um, you can message me on um, meetup.com um, or via the Roundabouts website. There's obviously loads of ways to get in touch with me. So um, just send me your uh, address and I'll get it send to the post to you um but um um i think we're i think we're done for for questions so i just want to thank you guys for giving up your time um and uh, and giving us uh, giving us such great talks um obviously we will be doing another uh .net roundabout we just need to um finalize a, a a date but i'm thinking um at this point um probably a couple of months from now and um and so, uh, yeah, we'll post it on um, the usual channels and all that sort of stuff. Um, also, I just want to reach out to to everyone who's been watching, and thanks thanks for your time. If any if anyone wants to give a talk, um, you know, please just get in, get in touch with me. Um, if there are sort of further questions and stuff like that, there's obviously the Slack group, um, and we want to obviously try and get that um, get that growing so it's a bit of a um, you know support base for for the community and all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, but I think that's, um, I think that's us for, for the evening. So, um, really appreciate all your time guys and, um, hope you right. enjoyed it and, um, I look forward to the next one. Thank awesome. you very much. All. By, by awesome. the next one, I want everyone to have watched Weird Science who's not already watched Weird Science. <laughs> <laughs> there, there'll be a quiz. I'll do my homework, Nick. Yeah, we can do another Raspberry Pi for a question on weird science. Question on weird science, absolutely. <laughs> I can get them all. I can win yeah, the trivia right now. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, well, uh, thanks, guys. And, uh, Thank you very much. Guys. Thanks, folks. Thanks, right. Bye, bye. 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 bye.